Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Okay, well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, we're uh, blessed to have our uh, friend and speaker, Ari the Thoris, today. Um, Ari has been practicing medication, med- meditation for approximately 35 years. She has received teaching from many renowned Buddhist teachers over the years. Pema Chodron has been one of her main sources of Dharma teachings. She studied and practiced with Ani Pema since the mid-1990s. About 13 years ago, she met Ani Pema's teacher, Zigar Contru Rinpoche, and became a student of his. She has also attended several teachings with mind-rolling Kondro Rinpoche. And as a professional sign language interpreter, Ari has interpreted for many Dharma teachers over the years. So welcome, Ari. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. I would love it if we could um, go around and just say your name and where you are right now so we can all bring our voices into the room together. I'm um, Ari, as you heard, and I'm in Oakland. I'm Cass. I'm in San Francisco. Richard in San Francisco. Chris in San Francisco. Bob in San Francisco. Mike in San Francisco. Carly in Berkeley. Ed in San Francisco. Charles in San Francisco. Tony in San Francisco. Henry in San Francisco. Jack the same. Kay in Oakland. Mike in Oakland. Samuel in San Francisco. Daniel in Oro Preto. Oh, wow. <laughs> David in uh, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. It's not nearly as chaotic as I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> did, we, did we hear from everyone? I believe. Okay. Just don't want to miss anyone. Great. Well, it's great to have people coming in from all over the world. Um, Zoom is wonderful in that way. It gives us a way to connect even when we're physically far apart. So I wanted to um, talk this morning about um, a concept in Tibetan Buddhism. The word is lungta, and in English that's translated as wind horse. And um, I'm sure most of you have seen Tibetan prayer flags, the colorful flags that Tibetans hang out to carry their prayers off. And um, most of those have five animals on them, Hmm. Um, the Garuda, the tiger, the lion, and the dragon are around the sides, and in the middle is often the wind horse, and it's Hmm. the energy that brings the energy of all the other animals together. Hmm. So there's a lot to be possibly studied about (laughs) each of those animals and certainly their relationships to each other, but today I'm just going to talk about the wind horse and it's the, it's the energy of basic goodness. You've probably heard that concept in your um, Buddhist practices and studies um, or the nature of mind. It's kind of that basic awareness and basic goodness that we all come into this life with. And through the practice of meditation, we're developing more and more contact with that aspect within ourselves. And it's a sense of confidence without ego. So it's it's just um, kind of that raw energy that we feel when we're living in alignment with our integrity. And 
there are, in Buddhism, we often talk about the absolute and the relative, and the absolute is kind of the expansive spaciousness that has no ground, nothing to hold on to. Um, kind of the mind of enlightenment um, lives in the absolute. And in terms of wind horse, the absolute is um, something that we possess, but it is not ours. That's kind of one of the ways it's described. So we all possess this thing, but we don't grasp it. We don't hold on to it. We want to give it the spaciousness to just exist within us. And in the relative, which is the world we are living in as humans, um, we can use this to inspire us to live within our values and to live with integrity. So it's that energy that we want to kind of cultivate when we're possibly facing a difficult conversation. There's many ways that I think about how to bring wind horse into my daily life. And, you know, many of us are co conflict averse and uh, we like to, avoid difficult conversations or difficult things. That's part of human nature to, um, you know, we want to attract the things that we like and keep them and hold on to them. And the things that we don't like, we want to push away and avoid. That's kind of the function of the human mind. But with wind horse, we can, instead of sinking into that, feeling of, I can't handle this, it's too difficult. We um, use the energy to kind of metabolize how we're feeling about the situation or the conversation. So we don't just say like, oh, well, I have to tough through this and jump right into it. It's more of a slowing down and a contemplation, um, figuring out how you might address a conversation with somebody without an agenda. So maybe you feel like this person has really hurt you, but in using your wind horse, you're kind of metabolizing your feelings about it ahead of time so that when you're actually speaking to somebody, you're showing up without an agenda and with an open heart and open mind. So that's one way of applying wind horse in your everyday life. Um, and when you do this, I mean, my experience has been when I can let go in that way, there's so many possibilities that open up. And when I'm constricted into my agenda, it's often very limiting. And I, it's, you know, it can get into the dualism of right and wrong or blaming somebody. So just being willing to show up without an agenda and seeing what happens, the whole world opens up in that moment. And that's what the energy of wind horse is like, which reminds me, I'm going to read a little quote by Cho Young Trinpa Rinpoche. Um, Cho Young Trinpa Rinpoche is, he was um, Pema Chodron's root guru. So when she started practicing Buddhism in the early 70s. Um, he had just come from Tibet and he brought the Shambhala teachings and the Shambhala practices to the West. And she became a student of his. And he has many, many good books. And this one is called Smile at Fear, Awakening the True Heart of Bravery. So he writes a lot about Wind Horse, but I just wanted to read a short paragraph with you. Wind horse arises in the basic atmosphere of awareness and mindfulness. Out of that space of basic constant sanity, a spark of delightfulness or a sudden flash of wakefulness can take place. This happens over and over again in your life. In the course of a day, you might descend into an almost subhuman level of doubt and depression and then bring yourself back to the level of spiritual warriorship over and over again throughout the day. The key to cultivating wind horse is the practice of meditation. On top of that, you make a connection to the principle of ashe or primordial wakefulness. Finally, your whole life is occupied or filled with the atmosphere of genuineness and flashes of wind horse can take place all the time. 
So I wanted to share that with you because he does talk about that. It's kind of like uh, an instantaneous inspiration. And it can be a shift from a really dark place or a really sad place to, oh, I have, you know, this energy is arising and you can shift away. Or it might just give you the energy to really connect with that sadness or that grief and feel your feelings knowing that those will change because everything's impermanent. So with this um, energy, we also connect with that reality that nothing is constant and nothing stays the same. So another um, way of using wind horse is just kind of dealing with the culture that we live in. It's uh, we live in a very, um, strong white supremacy, patriarchal, homophobic, misogynistic culture. And that culture disempowers all of us. Every single one of us is disempowered by it, even those that are benefiting from it, because it takes away our connection to each other. So that I, many of us have probably been involved in different political actions throughout our lives and it can feel really overwhelming to face all those forces that um, don't allow us to live as our full selves and to um, really express all of our humanity. Somebody was talking earlier about, you know, being a gay person in Buddhism. You know, even Buddhism in the West has some white supremacy culture in it. It's, we really can't get away from it anywhere we go. So how do we keep showing up in our full selves and how do we not allow the heaviness of that culture to take over? And again, that's where we can kind of um, find this alignment with our integrity and bring that energy up to keep um, doing whatever work it is we're doing in our lives to make the world a better place, which is also part of being a Buddhist in the West, is how do we show up to make the world a better place? And I'm sure all of you are doing that in your own daily little ways and bigger ways. And um, I know that meditation and the Bodhisattva practices have brought a lot of um, desire in my life to to bring um, my energy to make the world a better place. That can be through any kind of service. It can be through smiling at a stranger, doing a small kindness for a friend. All of those actions are part of the wind horse energy that we have. And another practice that I love that I think helps with wind horse is Tang Lin. Um, some of you may have heard of that. That's a practice of... Um, breathing in suffering and breathing out relief. And there's whole books written about it, so I won't go too much into it. But um, I know I'm sure all of us feel overwhelmed by the suffering we see around us at different times in our lives, even if it's just walking down the street in San Francisco. Um, many of you have said you live in San Francisco, and we've all watched the city change a lot. We've watched more and more people become poorer and without housing and living on the street. Um, and I, I myself feel really overwhelmed by the suffering I see going on around me. And I don't often feel like there's much that I can do. But one thing I can do is keep my heart open. And I find the practice of Tang Lin really helps in that regard. So when I see suffering, instead of getting constricted or coming up with stories or judgments, I can breathe in that suffering and imagine that I'm suffering in that way. And there are people all over the world suffering. I mean, maybe I'm fortunate enough to have a home right now, but, you know, I might not have a sense of belonging in my life, which is another way of feeling home. So I include myself in that and I include all people, all beings in the world that are suffering. And then I breathe out a sense of peace and relief and freedom so I find that to be a great practice um, when I'm feeling overwhelmed by what I see around me. And again, this is um, meditation is really the ground of all this practice, as uh, Shoyong Trungpa said, 
because through the practice of meditation, we're becoming friendly with our own minds, no matter how discursive they may be, because they always are. Um, so we're kind of noticing the thoughts that come and we're letting them go and noticing when we get stuck and can't let them go and kind of giving ourselves a break about all that because that's the, the way the human mind is designed to function. So we're so lucky that we have this technology of meditation to help us become more aware and to have more, um, be more empowered about how our mind is functioning and then what we choose to do with the thoughts that come and go. So I encourage everybody to keep meditating. And um, I wanted to have us break into dyads to kind of give a little um, more practical daily connection with this energy of wind horse. So I'm going to have you discuss two questions with each other so we can take um, maybe five minutes each. Or you can do one question and then the other, and maybe somebody could type this into the chat for me while I read them off. The first question is, how does wind horse show up in your life now? I'm sure all of you have wind horse in some area of your life. And just share that with each other. And maybe you can talk a little bit about how that feels to you. And then the second question would be, where would you like to have Wind Horse show up in your life that it's not present right now? And maybe think of ideas for how you can make that happen. There, is that clear to everybody? I think Cass is going to set us up in diet. Yes, Chris? Ari, can you explain again just quickly what Wind Horse is? You've given me a lot of concepts and I'm working with it. Wind Horse is the, the energy that's seen in meditation. And what, Go ahead. Yeah, it's that energy that you have when you're aligning yourself with your integrity. If you, yeah, like one of the physical manifestations I like to think of is the image of riding a horse. When you're riding a horse, you have to sit very upright and, and kind of engage your core and your legs. If you really think about it from a muscular perspective. And what does it take to bring all that together and to stay upright in your integrity? Okay. Great. Thanks. And I'm happy to be in one of the dyads if that's needed. And how long would you like us to? Let's um, do um, 10 minutes. So each person could have approximately five minutes. If you could give a warning at that time, maybe. Okay. Um, and we'll come back at 1132. like we're slowly coming back. Um, anything, comments or questions that came up through your, uh, oh, wow, now all of a sudden everybody's here. So um, I hope that was useful, and I wonder if any comments or questions came up. We have a few minutes we can, I can answer questions or just hear comments. So Ari, this is uh, this is Tom. Um, thank you for such a, a rich topic. I admit that I I confess that I joined about five minutes late, probably when you were defining wind horse. So I appreciate the little um, little refresher right before we broke out. But um, I'm still a little gray on fuzzy around the edges. You know, you talk about wind horse being something that we possess but we don't own like we don't cling to it um could you just say a little bit more about how i like when do i experience this in meditation in daily life all the time yeah thanks for the question um in the beginning i was talking about it as being um the basic goodness that we all come into this life with so it's like also a confidence that's not about ego. And that's the confidence of coming from my own um, alignment with my own integrity and my values. Um, it can come up at any time in meditation or you can, you can kind of um, instigate it to come up. So if you're feeling down, you know, you can say, okay, I want to align myself with, 
my thoughts in this way or my thoughts in that way. So really kind of having more control over where your energy goes. It's another aspect of it. Um, I was hiking the other day and getting, we ended up on this hike that would, turned out to be really hot and getting lost. And, you know, there was one person in the group was like, oh my God, this is so hard, this is so hard. And, and I thought, okay, I'm going to bring up my wind horse. And I, and just started looking around and wow, look at where we are. It's so beautiful. So kind of sh- just like a shift like that can be wind horse. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. That really, really helps a lot. Great. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, yeah. Could you, it, is there a, a connection it, to dealing with, you know, states of fear? Uh, cause that's what I'm dealing with a lot these days. And, uh, uh, I could use some, you know, wind horse energy, uh, to deal with fear, but I don't know if there's a particular connection. Uh-huh. Well, as, um, this book by Cho Young Trump, Trump is called Smile at Fear. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, part of the meditation and wind horse energy is to be with things as they are. So it's not to try to push away fear but to become friendly with your fear, to become intimate with it, to allow it, and also to recognize that all states of being are impermanent. So not to attach yourself to it or identify with it. But, you know, in this moment, I feel fear. In the next moment, you may feel something else. So the the wind horse is kind of that energy of not clinging and, but, and at the same time allowing. So kind of creating some spaciousness around your fear. Thank you. Yes. Um, Samuel. Yeah. Samuel is the name. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the teaching. Actually, um, Chogan Chumba had such a huge impact when I first began doing spiritual work for me that his, his book called the, the sacred path of the warrior. Mm-hmm. Um, and I happen to have a, a fear based, a very much a fear based personality wiring. I'm, in, I'm into the Enneagram and I'm, you know, the, the type that most experiences the fear, the free floating angst. Um, so one of the ways that, uh, I mean, something that I work with, I think it's really important is to, like I think about it is the energy of presence that's here that we are and it gets cut off by our stories and all that the tensions of, you know, of, of, you know, the habitual habits of our personality. And, um, so particularly with fear, um, you know, to drop, you know, it's to catch myself in the story and just to experience it as this raw energy. And a lot of times that, that, and there's the conversion, then there's a shift there and it just feels like, Oh, this is the life force that's coming through me, you know. And if I can relax from all of the, you know, the, the my aversion to it, my wanting, you know, my thinking that it's painful, and just actually get into the flow of it, you know, and that that this is, you know, this is a really wonderful energy when I can relax and and let it come through. So, a couple of comments from me. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Yeah, I like the comment about the storyline because. Often, um, whatever emotion we're having, we start feeding it through our stories. So if, if a feeling of fear comes up or a feeling of anger, and then we start justifying those feelings, especially we love to justify our anger, um, by adding the story about that other person and how they wronged us or that, you know, whatever experience we had and how horrible it was. Um, then if we can through meditation, keep practicing that, see the storyline and let it go. Um, then, you know, we want to also bring that practice off the cushion so that when we're in our daily lives and we see ourselves going down this road of some story, even if we believe it's absolutely true, um, it's probably blocking us from that, you know, basic goodness energy, that wind horse, um, like the energy of the actual emotion. So just feeling the energy and not the story. So thank you for that. Yeah. One other thing I want to add is I think it's really, 
and we get so cut in our head and the, and the thinking. So it's a dissociation from the body. I think it's really important to ground in the sensations of the body, you know, and then that opens to support the heart and still our busy minds that, um, again, are, you know, the source of a lot of our suffering is just the way we're interpreting things. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I had um, a question. Um, I mean, one of the things that came up in our group is that there are plenty of opportunities to um, to work on this in, when we're in public places and uh, dealing with other people's lack of awareness compared to our <laughs> hyper-awareness. Um, but I guess... I'm trying to get the distinction between like the wind horse and the tong lin. Is it kind of like wind horse is kind of a way of being and tong lin a way of acting? Is that kind of a distinction? Well, wind horse is, uh, is more of an innate energy in us, like connecting with our integrity, our basic goodness, the spaciousness that we can have in our heart and mind when we're not you know, judging when we're not holding on to a storyline. Tan Lin is an actual practice of um, sending. It's called sending, receiving and sending. So it's kind of we breathe in in the practice, we breathe in the suffering, and we send out relief. And that's like the very basic, simple way of describing Tan Lin. Um, so if you're interested in it, Pema Chodron has a book, called Tang Lin, and, you know, you could read that book, and it really breaks down the practice a lot further. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll speak up, because I, yeah, I, all the time. I, um, two things came up, actually, in my group. One was, you know, I look for the hook. I, there's a There's a physical sensation I have when I'm really dissociated from the uh, what I'm doing, and I'm room, it's a ruminant, let's say really being driven by a ruminant of thought. It's usually related to some sort of suffering in the past, or even from yesterday, or even from an hour ago, right? And I'll actually feel a physical sensation if I'm really clear with it, but it's, you feel more of that kind of sensation when you're sitting. So if I'm feeling a little bit of a hook, I'll actually sit for a quick five minutes, just as to re-engage and let, not so much to get rid of what's happening, but to watch it dissolve or see what it's really revealing or, or what kind of insight it's offering out. Zen practice is kind of like a Dharma gate. You're entering an area that's um, confusing, confusing pain, and there's actually some education there. You're always wanting to, in a sense, face that reality, but it's difficult. Um, and just recently, it re- oh, this reminded me, and I was talking in my group, my small group, that um, I watched the whole week long of Thich Nhat Hanh's dying and his crem- cremation and stuff. It was very, very intense and very interesting to watch and listen to his practitioners. And I had forgotten about this practice of having a mindfulness bell go off in the background. And Plum Village, where he, in France, where he was the main site, they had a big bell that would go off on occasion throughout the day. And it was a chance for everyone to stop and sort of re-engage with their wind horse in a sense. And so I often will, if I'm especially having some trouble sometimes, I've found that if I set my phone to go off like every 30 minutes with just that little ding or, or arbitrarily through the day, it really allows me to bring, remind me where I am right now. Where am I? What's my intention? You know, what's my deepest concern? If I'm, if I'm having a difficulty and I really want to do a practice, I could sit down and do tongan for five minutes just to get it flowing again. And, Tongan's great. It just, it's like, it does a, um, it's like you're getting your oper- operating system gets turned off and zip the other day because we usually push against that with people bringing in people's pain. We're usually paying our own or others. We're always kind of pushing against that and just allowing that little reversal gets everything to move around your nervous system. We're just going to offer that out. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ari. This has been great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's a good reminder. I mean, um, the re- why do we practice meditation? It is to become more mindful. So um, there are other techniques for mindfulness, like the mindfulness bell and just stopping in your tracks for a minute, um, sinking into your awareness, getting getting underneath the storyline to see what's really there. 
So all of those are great reminders. Yes, thanks. We have time for one last comment, I think, or a question, anybody? Oh, I think David might be. Um, one of the things that I've discovered is I am a very unique person. We're all very unique. And some of these things may not even resonate. And our own paths are so distinct. I'm just speaking for myself. My path has been so distinct. I don't have any. There's no one that I could say amended me. And I've had to figure it out on my own. And thank God for places where we're free to actually choose what we need for ourselves. And so like choosing for myself, choosing what works, what doesn't in the present is really the key for me. And I, I, I just think your Dharma talk has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Bob, you had a hand up. Yeah. A quickie. Um, thank you so much for your offering today. Um, I was wondering if my interpretation of Windhorse was valid because it made me think I like to connect with other people and I like to make the effort to do that connection. And I often, much to the dismay of the people listening, use humor or my humor. And, um, and I was just wondering if that's a valid interpretation of Windhorse, the energy and enjoyment to connect with other people. I think that's a fine interpretation of wind horse. Um, if you, if that's, you know, your a way of expressing your basic goodness is c- through connection, um, helping others to feel connected as well, you know, cause we always, um, as a Bodhisattva practitioner want to, um, relieve the suffering of, of others. So maybe one of the ways you do that is through hum- humor. I think that's great. Thank you. Because I, when I use the humor, if people respond with a smile or, oh, my God, that was horrible, I know that for a moment they stop thinking about whatever was bothering them. And <laughs> I, think, I take some joy in that. Yeah, that's great. Thank you all for your great thoughts and insights. Um, do we do we do announcements now and then dedicate the merit? Or? Yes, we'll okay. do an, an announcements now. Thank you so much, Ari. And Bob, we miss your jokes <laughs> at the, at the, uh, at Bartlett Street, where we will be returning next week. So we're going to try again, um, to meet in person and hopefully COVID will stay in its process of abatement, um, in the Bay Area so that, um, we can continue. So yes, next week. We have, um, there'll be a small discussion group, um, and, uh, both on Zoom and in, at Bartlett Street. So does anybody else have any announcements? Uh, I have two. Uh, just to remind people, GBF has a Wednesday meeting, same link as this. We meditate for a half hour and then have a, some kind of group discussion often very supportive of what's going on with people. Uh, so you're welcome to come to that. And uh, just to remind people that we have an account at Community Thrift. Uh, we got a whopping check, uh, I believe, the last quarter, and it's a great way to support GBF and uh, um, get rid of what doesn't serve you uh, materially. So, uh, But check their website because they're very particular about what they take. But uh, it's been very uh, a great way to support GBF. Thank you, Richard. Um, another way you can help support GBF is through the practice of Donna, um, the uh, Bali word for generosity. Um, it helps pay for our newsletter, which goes largely to incarcerated people, and um, the rent at Bartlett Street. Um, Donna that we offer to our um, speakers and. Hopefully sometime soon for um, dinners um, at uh, Larkin Street to help the homeless youth. Um, so, yes, gaybuddhist.org is where you can um, find links to, uh, to offer Donna. 
And you'll also find our fabulous library of audio uh, recordings of Dharma talks, something like 750 now, um, uh, presided over by George Hubbard. Thank you so much, George, for your service to the uh, to the Sangha. And by the way, happy birthday! Um, so yeah, now we any other any further announcements before we have the dedication of merit. Ari, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, and if you could ring a bell when I'm done, that would be great. Uh, let's take a minute just to come back to our meditation posture. You can close your eyes if you want. Take a few deep breaths. We dedicate the merit of our practice to all sentient beings in all directions. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings feel love and belonging. May all beings be free of inner and outer harm. And may all beings live with complete liberation. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Ari. Thank you. I'm I'm heading off to Yosemite, so I'm going to say goodbye to all of you. <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. Great to see you all. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers, so you can participate live, please. Subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.